this episode of Property Journal, I'm talking to Bob Wigley. Bob is an investor, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist. He's also the chairman of UK Finance. He's most recently written a book called Born Digital, the story of a distracted generation. As a parent of two children myself growing up in the digital age, it's an absolute must read for any parent. How he juggles family, work, life balance is something I'm fascinated to find out. The time he spends on his own mental health and mindset and how he fits everything in is going to be fascinating. I can't wait to talk to Bob. Bob, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Who is Bob Wigley? Oh, crikey, that's a difficult question. Uh, So I read a book when I left banking 10 years ago about how to be happy in life. Uh, And it was written by a woman who'd lost her job, as I had just done then. Uh, And uh, she said, basically, work out the five or six things in life to make you happy and then go and do lots of that. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Brilliant advice. That's amazing. The book, that must have inspired you then. What were you in terms of Bob before the journey to there? Yeah, so as a young Bob, I think I just knew I wanted to um, make money so that I could have a a comfortable life, a more comfortable life than maybe my parents had had. My dad was a teacher, mum didn't work, we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, and I think I wanted better for me and my children. So that ambitious Bob at a really young age, you've gone on to achieve so many different things in a multifaceted career, and I imagine that's still very much... Plenty going on. Was that in built into you from a young age or through achieving a certain amount of success? Um, did you then sort of find I think that it built was all momentum? down to our cleaner. So mum had this domestic help, as they were called in those days, Mrs. King. Right. I had no grandparents. And she told me about three times a day from four onwards that I was going to be a success. And she instilled went that. In. Yeah, totally went in. Wow. She instilled that confidence uh, that I was going to achieve and you're going to go far, Bob, and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, kind of here we are. And that, that mindset that clearly, you know, from being told that to you reiterating that and how you went about what you did, how much time did you spend and have you spent on your own mental health and mindset Too setting goals? Too little. So, I mean, just go go straight into it. When I uh, was chairman of Merrill Lynch during the yeah. financial crisis, we had obviously 18 pretty brutal months, 2007, 2008. At the same time, I was on the board of the Bank of England trying to help the authorities work out how to deal with the, the global financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And the thing about stress is it, it sort of creeps up on you bit by bit, day by day. It's incremental and you don't notice it, therefore. And by the end of the 18 months, I was not in good shape. And that was the time when, happily, my bank was taken over. I decided to take a bit of a break. It was when I took the break and suddenly looked back mm. at uh, what I'd been doing and, and, and started to analyse how I felt, I realised I was on the edge. Right. And if I hadn't stopped working for a few months, I would have been ill. And what did you do during those few months? Went away with the family. Okay. I went, on, went around Latin America, detoxed, didn't look at the Blackberry. Yeah. My wife might not be totally convinced about that. Well, there was nothing on it anyway because no one loved me anymore at that point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, just kind of got my life back. Uh, it's not a good expression, but it's true. And uh, I woke, I literally came up one morning. I was in the water in the Galapagos Islands and I thought I haven't looked at a phone for a week and anyway there'd be nothing there if I did. Sure. Uh, but I vowed that I would never let anybody control my diary ever again. I was going to be in control of my life from now on. So I, I, I worked for lots of people part time but I would never give my whole week to anybody and never let anybody tell me what I'm going to do with my day. So what did you do after that? Because I mean if detoxing in the Galapagos Islands, quality family time, fresh air, mm. being around nature, all of that, clearly well, you have we a know a, that's good You have a bit you. of a panic attack because you think that uh, you go from being chairman of a bank where the car arrives at the front door at 7 in the morning with a pile of papers and agenda and you basically do what it says on this bit of paper till 11 o'clock at night when you crash into bed. Just dictated to. Pretty much. Um, and suddenly there's nothing to do in any day unless you organise it. Uh, sure. It's a bit weird. It's actually very disorientating. I can understand why ex-prime ministers, for example, have mental health issues, as Mrs. Thatcher, I think, famously did, because you go from this uber stimulation to suddenly kind of a vacuum. Sure. Um, but I, having read this book, I thought about carefully about the things I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work with young entrepreneurs to try and create some businesses and help them grow. Sure. Uh, I wanted to do something philanthropic. I wanted to indulge my passion for music. Um, I wanted to do something academic, I wanted to do something relating to the government, uh, to stay in the kind of system. Um, And so I went and found a thing to go in what the Americans call each of these buckets. I found the very best thing I could put in each of these buckets. And that's how I filled my day. That's amazing. And so from then on, 
talk me through that process. And you, you've got all those things you've lined up, you've put them into a mixing pot to try and achieve. Was that then a mixture of setting goals and just kind of almost manifesting that to happen with, because you clearly, you know, very well networked, it's something that's clear. And anyone I've spoken to that does know you speaks very highly of you and says, oh, you know, Bob knows everyone. Do you feel that, uh, that you, you asked, uh, you know, asked before we came on to the interview about good stories. So let me give you a quick good one. So I think I can tell this. So uh, I get a call one day from the head of MI5 and he says, can you come and see me? So I, obviously you will say yes to that call. And uh, he said, well, lovely to see you again. And, uh, you know, the reason you're here, he said, is that um, when my predecessor left, he said, doing this job, you get to know the guy that runs the railways, the power stations, um, the airports. He said, because those are the people we deal with all the time for security purposes. But one day something will happen and you won't know the guy you need to speak to. He said, so I'm going to give you three telephone numbers. If that happens, ring one of these numbers and they will find you the person you need. Right. And I said, OK, fascinating. What's I got to do? He said, well, yours is one of the three telephone numbers. Uh, and then he said, actually, um, he said, as Andrew, this is the predecessor, was walking out, I said to him, so presumably in this scenario, I'm in a hurry. He said, which of these numbers do I ring first? He said, I know, ring Bob because he knows everyone. <laughs> Brilliant. And I can, that's very much been the feedback. In fact, um, Sir John Chisholm, who yes. I've known for years, yes. went to university with my father. Sorry. Complete coincidence yes. that I know him, mention him to you, and you instantly have a story about how you've done business together. Mm. And, which proved it. But uh, one thing that strikes me is in your position when you were actually suffering and had to pull away, a lot of people would have seen you as successful. Mm. How do you define success? Well, I think that happiness word is pretty important. Yeah. Uh, Thought you'd say that. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's a much uh, sort of may maybe forgotten word in a way. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're going to come on and talk about the book in a minute. But one, of the, one of the things I sh found shocking uh, when I was looking at the surveys of the children's society was that we apparently have the unha unhappiest children in the UK that we've had in the entire 25 years of their survey and we actually have some of the unhappiest children in Europe. Yep, I've seen uh, that. And I did find that pretty shocking. It's awful because it's a developed country, always been sort of seen as a stable wealthy country and yet um, let's bring the book into play because from an empathetic point of view I'm the father of an 11 and 13 year old, two daughters, um, and I'd love to know why you wrote that book. And for mm. those that don't know, it's Born Digital, the story of a, a, a distracted, distracted generation. There's me getting distracted. <laughs> um, it's rife. It's probably the biggest conversation I'm having with fellow parents uh, and colleagues, you know, talking about it all the time. I'd love to know what made you write that mm. book. Watching um, my own children. So I've got three boys who, when I wrote the book, would have been 21, 19 and 15 or something. And just observing the way they use technology and how it was affecting their, their lives, how it was affecting the development of their personalities. And the youngest one in particular, um, I wouldn't say he got addicted to gaming, but he was gaming quite a bit. Uh, it coincided with COVID, uh, which was when I was writing the book. Was that online gaming? Yes, so, yeah. yes, yes, online gaming. And, uh, you know, it, it raised a whole lot of questions in my mind about what was going on in that scenario. Mm. And he would be aggressive when he came off the gaming, if you could get him off it at all. Mm. <coughs> he won't recognise this description, by the way, but if he's watching but uh and so i decided just to start researching what was going on and, and also that they were very different so the older two were if, if you like were in the facebook insta kind of era you know tristan's more in the in the twitch uh tiktok era so yeah. very different platforms yeah because what i like about the content of the book is you are making a point that there is some good with it i've noticed it with my own kids and go back to lockdown they only just got um their mobile phones at that time yeah which my wife was dead against. I got, mm. And then I got a full avalanche of abuse from her sort of thing on the whole, yeah, that's all they're doing is on their phone. Yeah. But actually my oldest started to create videos. At wow. that time it was the little dances on TikTok. Mm. So she was doing her own Joe Wicks workout to TikTok. And then she wanted to create her own videos and learning editing and so on. My youngest was just chilling, clicking, chilling and clicking. And she's yeah. so creative. Mm. She's an artist, she has a scholarship at the school and so on. So I was, I was conscious that it's damaging her creativity by just watching other people and so just really encouraged her to then work with the social media that's out there mm. to learn about different artists what they're doing and then she's done that and she's taught herself off YouTube and so yeah. on so is there an element of if children are left to their own devices and of course the online gaming is a whole different conversation but certainly with the social media platforms if there's a certain amount of guidance and education around it can it be a good thing Crikey well so, so much in what you just said but yes. uh, so first of all my book is not negative about technology, it's negative about the way some of the biggest companies in the technology world, um, the culture of those companies and the way they operate their platforms. Yeah. It's also not negative about Generation Z, it's very positive about Generation Z. And of course, one of the great 
um, benefits of social media is it, it has brought access to everyone um, to the opportunity to, to create in the simplest sense. Yeah. You can become a celebrity, you know, through your own endeavours very easily with the with the technology that's available to you, and that's great. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, during the same period of 10 years where these um, technologies have become ubiquitous in every aspect of our lives, whether it's searching for information or organising travel or uh, watching a film uh, yeah. or simply, you know, chilling and scrolling on, on social media mm. or perhaps educating yourself, um, during that same 10-year period, you know, uh, rates of loneliness, um, unhappiness, depression... Anxiety. Uh, anxiety, ultimately self-harm and suicide, have broadly doubled, right? And uh, obviously we can't lay that entirely at the door of social media platforms, but we certainly can lay some of it at their door. Yeah. And that's why in the UK now the government is promoting the online safety bill that's going through Parliament. It will, for the first time, put a legal obligation on social media platforms to have regard to the harms they might be causing, particularly youngsters, to think about what content they might be looking at and then take action to mitigate those harms. And yeah. if Ofcom, the media regulator once a year will, will be looking at what they're doing very carefully and if it thinks they haven't done enough then it can take action yeah. by way of finding them to That's uh, a good encourage initiative. them to do more. It's a fantastic, it's world leading legislation, the UK should be very proud of it. Talk to me about UK finance. I'd love to know how yeah. that came about. Right. Um, what, you, know, you became chairman of that and I believe you founded that. So mm. tell me what, how that sits so and what it does. So there used to be six different bodies that represented uh, the banking and finance sector in the UK and the, bluntly the banking industry wasn't very happy with their performance. So they decided to put them all together. Yeah. So the biggest banks got together and decided to put all these six bodies into one, call it UK finance, mm. relaunch it with a kind of new mission and that was when I joined. Awesome. So we basically do three things. We we create the policy for the industry. So if the government's thinking about a new law or regulation that's going to affect financial mm. services, we think, well, how's that really going to affect consumers? And if that's what you're trying to achieve, isn't there a better way of doing it? Or mm. you know, you should be thinking like this. So we go to the government. We take that policy and we advocate it with government regulation, the, uh, regulators and the media. And then the third thing, which is the bit I'm most interested in, is we collaborate with the industry to try and help the industry both uh, provide better outcomes for consumers, but actually provide a better future for the industry. Right. So that might be around digital innovation, cyber mm. protection, anywhere where the banks can do things together, they don't need to do on their own. It's better for our customers. It's better for the bottom line. That's something I like to spend time on. And somehow, alongside doing that, you make time to meet with entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs with good ideas and, and spend time mentoring mm -hmm. and investing with them. Mm -hmm. How did that come out? What's, what was the motivation there? Yeah, I, bluntly, it was, it was spending too much time in public companies as a director of big public companies mm. where I'm afraid you don't spend enough time talking about the business. You spend a lot of time talking about governance. You sit on the nominations committee, the remnant, you know. It's all paperwork. Creativity is removed. Spending time with young entrepreneurs is very uh, engaging yeah. and very exhilarating. Yeah. And if you can, um, it is sometimes, uh, some days is a bit like having three extra adolescent children because they do, they can be prone to doing dumb things. So hopefully, you know, their uh, incredible uh, optimism and energy and a bit of your grey hair and experience put together may maybe sometimes can produce a, a better outcome. I can uh, see you, I, you enjoy I, that mentoring. I love sorry, it, I love it. So did you have anyone in your early years that mentored you or spent time with you that gave you that uh, almost desire to give back so as a, as a more really, experienced role? I, I had a couple of mentors, um, but it was kind of very old fashioned mentors. It's like one of my dad's friends, who was a headmaster actually, mm. said, if you want to succeed in business, you need to play golf. So he took me to a golf club and taught me to play golf. It was kind of interesting. Yeah. But this is, I think, uh, unintentionally from you, the cue up for the Mrs. Thatcher story, which I have to tell so, so I was in a I was in a scheme at school called Young Enterprise, uh, where you start a little company at school, ran it for a couple of hours a week, uh, and the company that I was managing director of at school um, won the national competition. Three years later, I'm in my first job, and I persuaded my employer to sponsor a Young Enterprise company. Funnily enough, that team won the national competition. On the way back. Uh, the 16-year-olds who I was driving in my car said, um, listen, you've had this great experience, we've had this great experience, how do we get one of these in every school in the UK? So I said, let's write to the Prime Minister. And they fell about laughing and said, well, you know, you're 19, we're 16, we can't write to the Prime Minister. So anybody can write to the Prime Minister. So I wrote to Mrs Thatcher, 
Slightly precociously, somewhat to my surprise, she replied by return saying, come and see me next week. So the four of us trot off to number 10, make her a presentation. She stopped the presentation and said, I completely agree with you. This is a fantastic scheme. Absolutely, there should be one of these in every school in the UK. She said, and luckily, she said, I've arranged the people who are going to make it happen. So we go next door into a room I now visit quite frequently, next to the Prime Minister's study, where was the Education Secretary, the Business Secretary, and a bunch of luminaries from the city, yeah. amongst which was the chairman of the bank. So you probably work out where the story yeah. is heading. So we make our presentation to these guys. They were all men then. And uh, the chairman of the bank said, well, I agree with you, absolutely this should happen. He said, but uh, you're obviously trouble. You better come with me. I'm, I'm going to take you and show you my bank. So we got in his chauffeur-driven car. We went off to, to from Downing Street to, to his bank in the city. And I remember sitting there looking at a view of St Paul's from his office window and looking at the Shagpar carpet, the mahogany desk, and having just come in the chauffeur-driven car thinking, chairman of a bank, that's what I'm going to do. I love it. That's a brilliant. Mrs Thatcher. Yes. It's exhausting actually listening to you in a good way. There's so many things that you're involved in and doing, and I imagine that's going to only continue. But how do you juggle all of this and be a father of three, married, and all the things you might well do in your social life as well? How do you, how do you juggle them? Keep I don't run in? anything. That's the key. So uh, I have run a big organisation with yeah. 9,000 people in 23 countries and half a trillion dollars of gross assets on the balance sheet. That is a 24-hour, eight-day job. That's where the stress comes in. Yeah, and, uh, hence and time when out I when left, came. I vowed, but part of the not allowing anybody to have my diary thing was uh, not uh, renting my whole life out to, a, to a, an organisation or a person. So I do lots of things, but I decide when I do them. Yeah. Uh, and if I, if I stop enjoying them, I stop doing them. Um, and I'm ruthlessly efficient. I've got a great uh, PA who's been with me for 25 years. She's even more ruthlessly efficient and gives me, gives me a hard time all the time, which is good, keeps you on the straight yeah, and narrow. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it kind of so works. So you're constantly evaluating that. I don't run that. out of things. I don't have no, that 24-7 on any one thing. Yeah, people call me and say, can you help me with this? Yeah. Yes, okay, sure. No, that's really interesting. What would you say is your greatest strength? Uh, this, probably. I like people. Yep. Uh, my whole life that. is built around meeting people, yeah. like, uh, trying to understand them, empathising with them. Empathy is one of the big... Learning. Learning. All the time. Empathy is one of the big subjects of the book because what social media and what devices do, unintentionally but systematically, is attack all the places where empathy in my generation developed. So sitting and doing this, me looking in you in the eye, mm. if I say something you don't like, you wince. If I say something you find funny, you laugh. And I get feedback from that. Yeah. That, that trains me as a person how to behave. What would you say is your greatest weakness? Oh, oh good question. Uh, well, perhaps sometimes not having empathy. I mean, I don't know, you have to ask my wife. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Greatest weakness. On a bad day. Uh, that's that's, that's I, isolated. I don't know. I think that's a really difficult question. I've got probably lots is the answer. <laughs> so with everything that you've done and are doing, what's next? Where, where have you still got goals and things you want to achieve? Because there's well, a lot of things you've done. I've one major ambition, which is to write a ballad. I want to, I want to chart success with a ballad. Yeah, that's that's one big ambition. Anything else? Uh, there are always things, you know, in, in each of the areas that I'm working in. That, I mean, I'm working for St John's Ambulance. I want to help them create a really good fundraising operation, and become more sustainable. Yeah. From from you know from charitable giving, uh, the Marines I work with trying to help put together um, soldiers who come back with really serious PTSD. You yeah. know, there's a lot more demand there than we can currently completely deal with. So it's a real purposeful mission that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And Feels like you're I'd drawn like to, see, to. I'd like to see some of my businesses succeed and exit. You know, it's yeah. easy to invest. It's harder to disinvest. That was my next question actually. Right. So I was going to say. So we talked about defining success and happiness, yeah. but in terms of business, mm. what's been your, what would you say has been your greatest success? What are you most proud of? Maybe they're two different things, you tell me. But uh, what is so it? I think when I became chairman of Merrill Lynch, we had a revenue of three billion and pre-tax income of probably the profit of 700 million. By the time I finished, we had revenue of six billion and profit of three billion per year. So, so a massive expansion of the business that yeah. did really well. And we were a force in Europe, uh, I remember getting a call one morning from our head of France who said, we've got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, well, you are apparently now the third most um, influential per person in uh, European capital markets. I said, sounds great. Well, what's the problem with that? He said, well, unfortunately, the French finance minister is only seventh and he's really pissed off yeah, about this. Yeah. I said, okay, well, we better go and see him. So, yeah. Um, so it was a great time. That, from a business point of view, that's probably the, the thing I enjoyed most. And it was a rip-roaring time till the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But having three fantastic children and a gorgeous wife is pretty important uh, because the rest of it doesn't work unless the home, the no. home, home life works. No. And actually through the crisis, just being able to go home, play with the kids, you know, leave, leave business behind, play with the kids, uh, get some grounding in the real world, yeah. uh, have, you know, have them take the piss out of you. And uh, that's kind of important. Yeah, it's amazing how many people say that. And of all the different um, entrepreneurs that you've backed or given advice to and so on, is there a real success story there that uh, well, you, have, some, you have backed and has, lot, has gone through Lots of done okay, but the one I think is, in the end, is gonna be really successful, but maybe isn't seen that way right this minute in, in her business, is Victoria Beckham. So I was chairman of her business for 18 months at a difficult that. time, uh, yeah. losing money. Uh, since then, uh, we did lots of work to improve the profitability, to to uh, improve the accessories range, to mm. change the way we were sourcing eyewear, mm. uh, to make it a more e-commerce orientated business. Um, so laid the ground, uh, the sort of ground rules, if you like, for yeah. subsequent success. She's then had COVID, uh, now she's got a cost of living crisis. But I think it will come through, and I think it, she's a very hardworking lady, she's a very good designer, she does a lot more than you would think in terms of masterminding the product, and I think in the end she's going to create a really valuable business. I hope she does, she certainly deserves it. Yeah, no, that's good. And obviously from her point of view, she's high profile, we all know who she is. Is there anyone that, uh, dare I say, has come to you as a, a young, unknown entrepreneur that has um, sought your knowledge, yeah, investment a, couple, and, a, couple, yeah. a couple I'd mentioned for different reasons. So there's a guy who uh, came to place course for me one day who told me he'd been bullied at school and he'd had ADHD and he was a spurging. Okay. And he basically uh, didn't perform well at school. These things were not recognised then, so he didn't know what to do about it. He sort of got thrown out of school, in, I think. Uh, anyway, he went, ended up very unusually for someone with mild autism um, mm working for a software company in their sales function and is really good at it, was really good at it. And so he went to his boss after a few weeks and said, I'm selling as much in four days as everybody else is selling in five. Can I have the fifth day off? And the boss said, well, what are you going to do with this fifth day? He said, oh, I'm setting up a charity to help autistic people into their first job. Fair play to him. So he now has a business called Neuropool, okay. which does exactly that. He's working with my old university and he helps uh, the autistic people, including graduates, into mm. their first job. It's a very scary thing if you're autistic meeting someone you don't know, the interview thing is kind of stressful, you're out yeah. of your box, which they don't generally like. Yeah. So he's what he's doing is fantastic. So I, I love that story yeah. because you know he's learned from his own experience. He's in a way cured his own Aspergerism and gone on to do something amazing with it. Uh, another guy I would highlight is running a little bit of business called Vidrate. It's a powder you put in water that makes yeah. water more interesting to drink. It's got fruit and vitamins in it, no energy, it's not sugar, zero, no sugar. sugar, zero calories. Uh, but he was a... Uh, plasterer from Keithley yeah. in Yorkshire, uh, but in, in his the other half of his life he was a sort of fitness fanatic and he yeah. realised through that that people don't drink enough water. They go to the gym but they don't drink enough water. Yeah. So he thought what would make people drink water? Oh okay, maybe if it tastes of something more interesting than mm. water, but it's also good for you. Uh, he then developed um, the ability to dissolve a powder in cold water, which is actually technically quite difficult. Okay. He, he discovered you couldn't do it, so he then went and worked with chemists and yeah. figured out how to do it. And he now has a little, this business called Vidrate, V-I-D-R-A-T-E, came to me, I put some money in uh, with his co-founder. I think they turned over the best part of a million pounds last year. Um, yeah. If you were to give advice to a young Bob coming through, call it, say, late teenage years into what becomes the career, with all the experience and knowledge you've got now and so much you've passed on to others, what would that be? Well, I guess the thing that drove me was whenever I got a job, I immediately started thinking about what was the next job that I wanted so, and how do I, at the same time as performing as well as I could doing the job I'm doing, mm. how can I position myself for the next job that I want? So that's so yeah, you're so always I, thinking ahead. Always thinking about the next that's job. That's interesting. That's crucial. So that's not an entrepreneurial mindset because you know that's about maximizing the thing you're doing at this moment. Yeah. Does that go hand in hand then? Do you have and have you always journaled? Have you always written down? Have you always had a plan or do you find that you're more intuitive? Interesting. Yeah, it comes into the head, I think. Yeah. Cuz journaling's getting a huge amount of publicity at the moment. A lot of people are swaying by. And I just wonder whether that's because they need to have the map. They need to be making notes from now and seeing whereas it feels like you're already you've kind of mapped this bit out. You're already thinking about how that next think, bit happens. So growing up in, in the bit of the bank that I worked in, you were always working on nine or ten clients and projects at the same time. Yeah. You know, you might do an hour of this, an hour of that. And mm. so you get quite good at juggling multiple projects that are in totally different 
It's different transactions, different industry, different numbers. Yeah. You get quite good at that. And I think that sets you up then for later yeah. in life where I'm doing what I'm doing, which is exactly that in a different way. We had a chat off camera about property. So what's your, what's your thoughts on where property's going in the UK? We've had interest rates increase uh, over the last few months and everyone's sort of talking it down. But actually, there's, there's no seeming You're talking crash. about resi property? I'm talking, I am talking about resi yeah, yeah. property, yeah. So, um, so I think the one interesting slight negative in the data recently, very recently, was sort of talking December onwards, mm. uh, is a cooling off in the property, in the resi property sure. market. It's, it's basically what happens every time prices stop going up. Uh, people think they're going to fall, and so they sit on their hands and don't move. And that's all you're seeing. So mortgage applications have gone down, mortgage approvals have gone down. Um, I don't think it's going to last that long. I mean, we have a fundamental housing shortage in the UK. Mm. The population is still growing. So yeah. basic supply and demand dynamics would, you know, with a bit of growth, would suggest that we'll, we'll return to growth in the resi housing market. Yeah. It may just be, you know, six, 12 months of... Uh, Price is not changing much. No. I don't think they're going to fall significantly. That's interesting. And people have got to get used to the fact that what you know, for such a long time interest rates were so low, mm. it's costing more to borrow now. But actually, people um, far older than me are quite quick to say, "Well, I remember interest rates at fifteen percent. This is yeah. nothing like." You know, but when you get used to it so low, it's uh, it's going to just shock people into not. Uh, but you, should you be concerned about you know being able to fix your mortgage rate at three-ish percent? It does feel like people are getting used to it. I mean, as we sit here now, the, the news is that it's certainly not going down anymore. It's stabilising. Does that mean it's about to pick up? Because the big thing for me is there's a shortage of supply. There's a huge amount of demand. But, you know, yes. There's not so, enough so, properties so, being built. Saying. So ultimately, the dynamics of the pricing of the real yeah. market are essentially on the positive. So, yeah, I think yeah. we will return to it. I mean, how fast prices go up remains to be seen. But I think yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get through this period and we'll return to, to growth. No, I agree. Bob, I've so enjoyed talking to you. There's Likewise. so many things in the conversation, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.